Thank you so much, Clark, for that, um, that much too generous uh, introduction. I'm really sorry that uh, all those long ago and not hugely meaningful awards were inflicted upon you this evening, <laughs> but I appreciate the, the gesture. Um, I wanted to uh, see if we could kind of get a little bit of a sense of what's going on in this campaign, what the stakes are, what the next uh, presidential uh, administration might feel like, how it might change the country, uh, whether we'll become a more liberal, progressive country or not. And then I hope we can uh, open it up as uh, quickly as we can to, to questions. It's more fun for you and more fun for me if we make it a little bit interactive uh, tonight. Um, I wanted to uh, get going with um, what the title that we put on this thing, uh, this, this lecture, which is the stakes. Um, I actually think the stakes in this election are surprisingly simple when you boil them down um, to their essential uh, ingredients. And I, I would summarize it this way. The stakes are how the world sees us and how we see ourselves. Um, now, why would that be the central issue, how the world sees us and how we see ourselves. Um, and it's something, by the way, that uh, Barack Obama doesn't talk about very much, uh, nor John McCain, um, because uh, when you're trying to get votes in the United States, talking about how the world sees us is not a terribly compelling or sexy issue um, for swing voters. Um, but it, 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 America's prestige in the world um, it has very, uh, it, it's important not just for kind of grandiose reasons, uh, uh, but for very pragmatic reasons. Because the, the thing about American leadership and global respect is that it is connected to every single other issue uh, that faces the United States um, and the world, from terrorism to climate change to uh, you know, Russian aggression, to AIDS, to poverty, uh, obviously to um, international uh, uh, economic stability. Um, we found out that uh, when uh, uh, the United States suffers, suddenly uh, Iceland goes bankrupt. Um, that uh, it, when Ireland insures its bank deposits, all of a sudden there are bank runs across other parts of Europe so that people can put their money in Irish banks. So we're all connected to each other and all these problems are gonna to have to be solved uh, globally. Um, even the idea of American education or healthcare, if we're not strong at home, we won't be strong internationally and if we're not strong internationally, we won't be able to lead. And if we don't lead over the next 10 to 20 years, who will? It'll be, as, as the 20th century was called, the American century. The 21st will be called, I don't know, the China century, uh, the India century, somebody else's century, if we don't pull up our socks and start acting like Americans again. So the, the stakes in that sense uh, are not just about uh, uh, making us more popular for popularity's sake or, or because it's nice to have uh, the United States uh, uh, respected uh, to make us feel better, um, but because we, we can't get going on this problem solving uh, until we restore our prestige. Um, you know, it, it reminds me of um, this book that I think all of us read at some point in eighth or ninth grade, um, the Adventures of Tom Sawyer, you know, Mark Twain's book where Tom, and I might be remembering this a little bit wrong, so maybe somebody can correct me. Uh, Tom um, is asked by his Aunt Polly to paint the fence. And Tom doesn't really want to paint the fence, but he knows he's going to get a whipping or something bad's going to happen to him if he doesn't get the fence painted. So he manages to get his friends to join him in painting the fence, and they get the fence painted, and then they can go and off and do what they wanted. We have to get other countries to help us paint the fence. We have to lead them into uh, 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 
international fence painting on a wide variety of issues, um, or we're all going to get a weapon uh, in, uh, in the years ahead. Um, and I think we've started to see some of the consequences uh, of the failure of, of uh, American leadership in the world in the last, uh, in the last seven years. So I guess it's getting closer to eight now. Um, so those are the, the stakes, and I'll get a little bit later to why I think our view of ourselves and what we're capable of as a people in the context of America's stained history, particularly on race, uh, in a little bit. But first I wanted to give you a little sense of how we got to this pass, uh, where we are right now in this campaign. Um, to my mind, um, uh, the most important part of Barack Obama's resume is a part of his career that doesn't get talked about very often, uh, especially lately because it's connected to ACORN. <laughs> but um, I, I first met Obama in the uh, late 1990s when he was um, already in the Illinois State Senate. Uh, I'm from Chicago originally. I had a lot of family and friend connections to Obama. Um, kept getting told there was this really bright state senator I needed to meet. Um, and one of the things that I was told about him in this period impressed me, and it went back to 1992 when uh, Obama uh, was uh, pretty fresh out of Harvard Law School where he'd been the first uh, African American editor of the Harvard Law Review, as you know. Um, he was back in Chicago. He had worked in the community as a community organizer before law school, um, and that gets talked about a lot. But now he's back. He's working for a small civil, civil rights uh, law firm <clears throat> and um, uh, turned down the big downtown corporate law firm to work in a smaller firm doing uh, civil rights cases. And he gets an assignment in 1992 uh, when Governor Bill Clinton was on the ticket and a woman named Carol Mosley Braun was uh, nominated by the Democrats in Illinois to be uh, a United States Senator. Uh, um, and she became uh, the second African American Senator since Reconstruction. Um, and uh, she only lasted a term, but she was up at that point. Um, and Obama was assigned to run something called Project Vote, a registration drive in the city of Chicago. And this young guy, pretty fresh out of law school, ended up registering with the help of literally one or two other people, 150,000 new Chicago voters which took Illinois from being in the kind of swing state category into being a very solid democratic state and swept Carol Mosley Braun into the United States Senate that year. Um, once an organizer, always an organizer. <laughs> and uh, organization is the hallmark of the Obama campaign, uh, meticulous organization. And I believe in the same way that a fish, you know, rots from the head, a fish also navigates from the head. And so if you, if you have somebody with a, a certain sensibility at the top of any organization, they're going to end up hiring people who are similar to them in certain ways. So it's no surprise that in hiring David Pluff as his highly organized campaign manager, then daily David Pluff in turn hires a series of other very highly organized, talented organizers beneath him. They in turn hire really good organizers, and pretty soon, uh, you have an outstanding organization which um, by most accounts now is uh, the most advanced state-of-the-art political organization uh, in modern political history. Uh, doesn't mean they can't still lose, but they are extraordinarily well organized. Um, so organization is the first of three uh, key factors. Um, the second is message. Um, Obama read this election and what was happening before uh, other people did. Um, I uh, had written the first um, cover story on Barack Obama in any magazine at the end of 2004, 
And I remember I went down to Washington and I brought my then 14-year-old son with me, um, and uh, partly because he wanted to see a Washington Wizards basketball game. But I said, you get to sit in on an interview with Barack Obama, newly elected to the Senate, hadn't been sworn in yet. And um, uh, after the interview, uh, my son said, well, he should run for president next time. And so in a typical fatherly, patronizing way, I said, now, now, Tommy, he hasn't even been sworn into the Senate. You can't talk about him running for president yet. It's a nice idea, but it's just not gonna happen. But there was something about his message uh, that even then was just extraordinarily appealing, especially to younger people, because it was a message about the future. And in interviewing him then and then uh, in the next uh, couple of years uh, um, as he got ready to run for president, um, I uh, particularly focused on a uh, phrase that he used, that it was time to turn the page. This was basically his argument uh, against Hillary Clinton that um, she was in some ways a candidate of the past. And of course you've seen that uh, now, in, in the essence of his argument against John McCain is that it's a future versus past campaign. Um, that is a powerful message in American politics, and it always has been. Um, the political landscape is littered with those who have run on experience and failed. Uh, Richard Nixon ran on experience against John F. Kennedy in 1960. Um, uh, you saw uh, that uh, you know, Walter Mondale ran on that uh, against uh, Ronald Reagan. Uh, Gerald Ford ran on it. Oh, pretty much all the losers, all the, they ran on experience. Uh, and um, experience is just not as powerful a message as um, uh, the future looking forward rather than looking back. Americans have always been a future-oriented uh, society. So his message and his theme from the get-go were on point. He recognized that it was a change election. It, wa it was about change more than experience, and by the time his main rivals caught up to that and tried to adjust, as both of them did, Hillary moved to a change message, and uh, in picking Sarah Palin, McCain moved to a change message. Um, but Obama was there first, which gave him a big, big thematic advantage uh, early on. Um, and then I think the third um, factor that has taken him on this unlikely journey is temperament, which has been getting a lot of uh, discussion lately. Um, uh, I have a chapter in my book on Franklin Roosevelt in, uh, in 1932 and 33. The book is about, fittingly, it's about the banking crisis of 1933 and how Roosevelt saved capitalism and democracy when they were uh, at their moment of great, greatest peril and lifted the country up. And um, Roosevelt was uh, the guest of Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, the retired, then retired Supreme Court Justice, great justice, on the occasion of his 92nd birthday, just a few days after he took office, after Roosevelt took office with his famous only thing we have to fear is fear itself speech, which by the way was nonsense. If you were worried about how to put food on the table, that's something real to fear, it's not fear itself. Uh, if your uh, community has, you know, 25, 50, 80 percent unemployment. Um, but he was casting a spell on the country and uh, lifting folks up, uh, restoring their confidence. And he goes over to this birthday party at Oliver Wendell Holmes' house, and they drink a little bootleg champagne. Uh, and after he leaves, uh, the new president leaves, and Holmes says, second class intellect, first class temperament. Uh, and uh, the potential that Obama has, uh, even if he might not be, uh, as FDR was described, uh, meeting FDR was like opening your first bottle of champagne, is the way Winston Churchill put it. Uh, and I'm not sure that 
Obama has quite that effect, um, but he does have and has shown um, that he uh, is temperamentally suited to the job. He, uh, and we saw this during the, the recent financial crisis. He was very steady, uh, calm, and that was conveyed in the debates. I think that had a lot to do with why he's opened up this, uh, this lead in the polls, is that people sense that he has a temperament that uh, is suitable. And unlike FDR, he actually has a first-class intellect as well. Um, so we have at least the potential to have a president with a first-class intellect and a first-class temperament. Does that guarantee his success in the presidency? Absolutely not. He could make all sorts of mistakes and stumble on all sorts of things uh, that uh, caused him to fail. But in terms of the odds moving forward, it always helps to have somebody uh, with a temperament that uh, is, is suited to the times. So, okay, those are three reasons why Obama's done well. How about three reasons why McCain's done less well? Let's start with temperament. Um, I've known John McCain much longer than I've known Barack Obama since the early 90s, and we spent a lot of time uh, with McCain, particularly in 2000, on his famous Straight Talk Express bus, which is now kind of run into the ditch. Uh, but... Uh, we came to like him very much personally, um, and great company, and often had a wonderful temperament. Um, but we heard plenty of stories about his sort of erratic and sometimes uh, uh, highly, uh, I guess the word would be volcanic uh, personality. Um, didn't see it much directly. Um, but heard about it. So this year I went actually back to some of his colleagues in both parties in the Senate, and I took a little, very small sample poll, but I talked to six of them, and five said that they thought that he was temperamentally unsuited uh, to be president, um, which is one of those issues that's kind of burbled under the surface of this campaign, hasn't really uh, quite um, uh, dominated the uh, debate to the extent that it might have, but you have seen quite a number of articles about temperament, seen that word in print uh, in the last couple of weeks. Um, I also think that his uh, message has been problematic. As I said, he moved from experience to change. If you're picking, um, the moment he picked Sarah Palin as his running mate, uh, he, he obviously was jettisoning the idea that experience was the most important factor in selecting a president. He had, he had said uh, in an interview to, with Sean Hannity in, in July um, that uh, when asked what is the most important quality you're looking for in a vice president, he said somebody who shares my priorities and my uh, principles and somebody who could step in immediately, quote unquote, should something happen to me. Uh, and then he said, my case, kind of chuckled, that's especially important. He was referring to the fact that uh, he would be the oldest person ever elected president of the United States uh, should he succeed. Um, and that he's a, like me, he's a cancer survivor and there are other issues that increase his odds of perhaps not serving a full term. Um, but instead of picking somebody who was immediately qualified to be president, he chose uh, somebody who um, is refreshing for a lot of voters, um, pops off the screen, um, but it's hard even for a number of, of Republican analysts to say in all honesty uh, that she's qualified to step in immediately. Not for lack of experience, because Barack Obama's not very experienced. A lot of these folks are not very experienced. But for lack of knowledge, depth of knowledge about the issues that the next president would face. I think knowledge and experience have been confused in the discussion of Sarah Palin. Uh, why do you have to have that base of knowledge? Because your advisors disagree. Um, and it just say, well, I'll just listen to advisors. That's what George W. Bush said in 2000. He would have great advisors around him. And the problem is uh, it's, uh, it's just not enough. It's necessary but not sufficient for a president to be surrounded by, 
by smart people. They have to be smart enough themselves to sort through the advice. Um, so John McCain switched his message from experience to what? What exactly? Uh, I think one of the reasons that he is uh, not doing so well these days is that there's a lack of clarity about what he's actually offering the American people at this point, um, besides trying to disqualify his opponent uh, with some, you know, some, questionable, uh, some questionable attacks. He hasn't articulated a real vision of where he wants to take the country or, or a coherent uh, uh, message. Um, and the message that he plastered all over his convention, country first, um, has worn a little little thin, uh, as it's clear that on at least certain occasions he's put politics first, um, not country. I think if he had, um, ironically, he's a, a tough character, but ironically he wasn't tough enough um, in saying to the Republican Party, look, I've got the nomination now. I'm going to remake this party in my image. I'm going to pick Joe Lieberman or Tom Ridge. Imagine if he'd picked Tom Ridge, he'd now be very competitive in Pennsylvania former governor of Pennsylvania, and to essentially say to the conservative wing, I've never liked you, you've never liked me, you're gonna vote for me because you don't like the alternative, I'm gonna gallop toward the middle, which is where the voters are and essentially run as an independent. If he had done that, it would have, first of all, been more sincere because he's not a, 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 an ideologue. Um, he is a, a pragmatic, uh, Republican. If you recall, he voted against President Bush's tax cuts in 2001. He sided with Democrats on a number of different issues and showed a flexibility that was very clear every time I interviewed him. Uh, and yet you're not seeing that now because he decided to do something that you would have thought from his study of military history that he would avoid, which is he's refighting the last war. Um, the last war in 2004 was uh, out of the Karl Rove field manual, it was consisted of two parts if you were a Republican. You play to your conservative base and you try to depict the other guy as being unpatriotic in some fashion. And it worked very well for Republicans in 2004 and it worked in earlier elections. Um, but we're moving to a different place. A lot's happened in seven years. Uh, and if uh, McCain had been tough enough and more imaginative in seizing control of the Republican Party and casting it in his own image. Uh, he might have had uh, a better shot than he does now. And the third related uh, problem for McCain, it is that everything about him has been tactical. It's interesting that in the first debate, he, confused, uh, he uh, accused Obama of confusing strategy and tactics. It's actually McCain who has confused strategy and tactics. Obama has had a strategy all along, and he's tried to avoid a lot of the tactical cut and thrust of politics, sometimes to the dismay of his supporters. They say, well, why aren't you responding? They said this about you, they said that about you. Why aren't you fighting back? Why aren't you punching harder? Remember when everybody was saying that? It's because he was trying to stick with his strategy and not get pulled down into these tactics, whereas McCain is very responsive to every little shift in uh, the daily news cycle and he tries to uh, play it to tactical advantage. Joe Biden makes a gaffe the other day. He's jumping on it with some new ads, try to uh, exploit that. The problem is in a big year with big change, um, strategy trumps uh, tactics. People realize that uh, who put lipstick on a pig is a little less important than who bankrupted the country, you know, through their <laughs> <laughs> through their policies on Wall Street. Um, and the pivotal moment clearly was that period in September uh, when McCain was trying to respond to the crisis tactically. Every day it was a different thing. First, uh, the uh, economy is fundamentally sound. Then, no, no, it's not fundamentally sound. Then I'm going to fire the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Then, no, I'm not going to fire him. Uh, I haven't read Bernanke's three-page plan to inject $700 billion into, the, <laughs> into Wall Street. Yes, I have read the plan. I'm against the plan. I'm for the plan. He was moving in a tactical but erratic fashion, um, and the American people sensed it. And Obama 
surrounded himself with Warren Buffett and Paul Volcker and seemed steady and calm and didn't stick his neck out very far. And at the end of that two-week period is when he opened up, uh, opened up his lead. Um, but, there's always a but, <laughs> or more than one but. Um, none of this analysis should be construed in any way as suggesting that the election is over. Because uh, the truth is that we simply still do not know for sure what will happen uh, two weeks from yesterday. Um, the reason for that, to my mind, um, is uh, found in what insiders called LIVs, low information voters. We don't have any LIVs in the house tonight because you wouldn't be here if you were an LIV. <laughs> uh -huh. LIVs are not people who get their news from John Stewart and Stephen Colbert. <laughs> My wife works for Stephen Colbert. <laughs> I'm actually flying back tomorrow to go on the show to talk about FDR, a little nepotism action. Um, but the, uh, the idea that, the idea that uh, people would, uh, got, you wouldn't get the jokes if you were an LIV. Uh, so by definition, the people who are watching those shows are well informed. Um, by definition, the people who are watching cable of any kind are at least relatively uh, well informed. You could even argue that the 50 million Americans who voted in the primaries are at least relatively well informed. If they took the time to go to uh, vote in a Republican or Democratic primary, they at least you know, cared somewhat. However, the universe of voters on November 4th is not 50 million, it's 125 million. So there are 75 million people uh, who did not vote in the primaries, who they do this, they don't vote much in local elections, if at all. They do this one thing every four years. They go and vote for president. They're not paying a lot of attention. The 50 million who watched the debates are probably roughly the same 50 million who voted in the primaries or who watched, you know, and the cable universe is tiny. Everybody's always talking about I shouldn't admit it because I'm a cable guy, but you know, it's small. Uh, if you add up all of the numbers on a really good night, uh, cable is getting, a, a cable network will get a million viewers. Um, and so you add it all up and you're talking about a, a total universe of 10 million out of, out of 125 million. So you have a lot of people, they're not stupid, they're just busy, they have lives that really don't involve politics, they don't care much about politics, and a lot of them don't even tune in until the World Series is over. So they're still really not paying tremendously close attention. Now this year, there are fewer undecided voters than in past elections, uh, or people who uh, do not state a preference um, when, when the pollster calls, um, but that group of voters uh, is expected by everybody, Obama people, independent folks, to break heavily uh, for McCain for a lot of, a lot of different reasons. Uh, in past elections, they've often voted uh, broken for the Republican toward the end. You may recall that John Kerry was leading in some polls going up to that last uh, weekend. Now something else happened that last weekend, which is that Osama bin Laden popped up with a tape and um, was very um, jarring just um, three years after 9-11. And John Kerry later said that he lost um, because uh, it was a 9-11 election and that, that that tape stopped any progress. It was a self-serving thing for him to say, but I think he was actually right that he might well have won that that election if that happened, hadn't happened. But in a lot of ways it was his fault um, because 
In 2003, he gave a speech that I attended where he attacked uh, uh, President Bush for failing to catch Osama bin Laden at the Battle of Tora Bora. And then he dropped the issue, and he didn't talk about it at all. And I later found out that it was because their polling showed that the American people, for some reason, uh, didn't want to hear, you know, criticism of the government for not catching bin Laden. Uh, it wasn't registering, it wasn't changing people's minds. They should have stuck with it anyway. I think they were also worried that maybe bin Laden would be caught and then they would lose that as an issue. But the net effect was when he popped up, um, uh, if Kerry had been saying they failed to catch bin Laden, then the public would have responded by saying, hey, yeah, they, they didn't get him, here he is. But because Kerry hadn't laid that groundwork, um, Bin Laden just came on as the, you know, the big bad terrorist who George Bush is protecting us against. This time, o Obama has laid that groundwork. And by saying in the debate, I, I will kill him, you know, uh, and by talking all year long about bombing the Pakistan-Afghanistan border if necessary to get him, which might alarm some people in this room, uh, uh, but it's the kind of muscular foreign policy that many Americans respond to. I think he has created a situation where if Osama bin Laden pops up next week, as I expect he will, he follows these American elections pretty closely from his cave, as we saw four years ago, that this time, instead of going, ooh, we're scared, we're scared, we gotta go back to the Republicans who protected us, people will go, they haven't got him, it's seven years, he's still at large. Bush didn't get him. McCain is saying, I know how to get him. Well, if you know, tell your friend George, <laughs> you know? Uh, so, um, I think the Democrats will survive that if it happens. To me, that's the, the one remaining uh, potential game changer wild card. Um, of course, if there were to be an actual terrorist attack, then all bets are off. But I think that the Democrats uh, could survive uh, uh, Osama bin Laden popping his head up. But on the fundamental question, the, the elephant, or the donkey in the room, uh, the question of race, um, we just simply don't know. Um, at the beginning of the campaign, uh, I wrote a cover story that had Hillary and Obama on the cover, and it was, is America ready? Is America ready for a woman president, an African-American president? And after talking to a lot of people, uh, I concluded <laughs> it was a little bit of a bait and switch because I didn't answer the question in the story. Um, I said, you know, the, the, the only honest answer is that we won't know until election day. For all the polls and all the punditry, we simply don't know. We don't, uh, we don't know uh, how much of a so-called Bradley effect there is. I think that's, my own feeling is that that's not a huge thing, um, but a bigger potential problem is the low response rates to polls. In other words, large numbers of people are just slamming down the phone and not responding not answering the questions. The polling companies don't want to tell us how low their response rates are because that makes them look bad. And the news organizations don't want to tell us that the polling companies are hiding their low response rates because the news organizations are in bed with the polling organizations because it's part of brand extension for Wall Street Journal, ABC, whatever the news organization might be. Uh, and so the we're left with polling as more art than science, and no real understanding of where the people who don't respond to polls, uh, where their preferences might lie. Um, and so it's, uh, it's unknowable. And it's why um, my own sense is that I think if, if Obama goes into a, uh, uh, into election day, um, with less than a five point lead in a particular state, he might well be in trouble uh, in that state. Not because people are lying to the pollsters, but because they're not getting to all of the 125 million, a representative sample of the 125 million people who are gonna vote. Um, so, uh, 
Will that happen? I, I don't think it's likely. Could it happen? It's possible. If it does happen, uh, I think it will be a hard day for America because part of what's at stake is not just how the rest of the country views us, but how we view ourselves. And the original sin of American history was a constitution that enshrined slavery uh, and our history has been marred um, by the, the race question for more than 200 years and we have a tremendous opportunity to move beyond it. Does that mean that those who choose not to vote for Barack Obama are somehow racist? Absolutely not. And I think there are a lot of liberals who are kind of wrongly jumping to that conclusion. People can have all kinds of legitimate reasons for voting for John McCain. Maybe they've been lifelong Republicans. Maybe they agree with him on economic policy. We could enumerate the reasons. But collectively, if the country decides that this uh, candidate, Barack Obama, uh, who has everything else going for him at this point, um, is somebody who they can't ultimately vote for. Uh, collectively, they are making what is inescapably, at least partially, a racial decision. And that is a sad, that would be a very sad comment. Uh, I don't think Republicans would be that cheerful the next day. They're, first of all, a lot of them are expecting McCain to lose. And if he won, I, I think they'd sort of know in their hearts that the party of have, of Lincoln had completed a metamorphosis into the party of cynicism, uh, the party that, you know, tried to rip this guy down at all costs. The nation would survive. McCain might end up being a decent president. History is full of surprises. Um, but I think we would end uh, 2008 uh, with le not just less respect in the world, which we can ill afford right now, uh, but less faith in ourselves and that faith is uh, the faith on, on which all else depends. Because if we don't have confidence and faith in ourselves, not only can't we restore our economy, but we can't have the kind of cultural uh, dynamism that has defined our country and given us our, our mojo. Now, I don't want to end on a, on a downer, because I think that the uh, uh, groundswell of uh, grassroots activity, I'm mixing a metaphor there, is astonishing that I've witnessed in so many different states. And here in California where there's no contest, there, I heard today that more than a million calls have been made by Californians into other states uh, using uh, something at the Obama website to, uh, to make those calls um, and uh, Veterans calling veterans, women calling women in, in Ohio, Colorado, New Mexico, Florida. Uh, that's a tremendous tribute to the people of California, uh, whether one is for Obama or not, that people are taking democracy into their own hands. And um, I kind of reflect back on, in just in, in, in concluding here, on a moment I had with President Clinton, when he was at his lowest ebb, it was the, arguably the single most embarrassing day of the American presidency. It was when the Paula Jones tape was running all over television. And um, the president was down at New York University and I kind of scammed my way like a pushy reporter into this reception with the president and Tony Blair. And uh, Newsweek had helped expose the Lewinsky scandal and so we hadn't, I hadn't seen him for about a year and a half, and I was pretty sure he wouldn't want to see me. Uh, to the contrary, call me over, come on over, come on over. And um, it was the opening of the General Assembly of the United Nations that day. And I said, how are you holding up, Mr. President? And he said, I'm doing, I'm doing just great, you know. <laughs> so, he said, those, those Latin American leaders, they came in. They came in uh, to the UN today and they whispered in my ear, you know, Mr. President, you're lucky. In our country, when they stage a coup d'etat, they use real bullets. 
<laughs> and I and I said, well, but how about how about these midterm elections that are coming up? The 1998 midterm elections. This is 10 years ago, almost exactly. And he goes, oh, we'll be fine in that. And they were. Uh, it turned out he was right. I said, why is that? He said, because when you give the American people enough information, they always get it right. They always get it right with enough time and information. And I don't know if I would use that word always, but I think that the American people are good people and that they usually get it right and use their common sense uh, to guide our country uh, in the right direction. And so I, doesn't take a rocket scientist, certainly not this evening, to figure out uh, which side I'm on in this particular contest. Um, and I think it will, uh, I think it will um, come out right in the end because I have faith in the fairness and decency of the American people. Thank you so much and look forward to your questions. What about impeaching George W. Bush to accelerate his eviction from the White House and then prosecuting him for war crimes? Uh, the question, I guess you could all hear it. Um, I, I've been uh, against that all along, personally, um, because... Wh which one? Well, the prosecution? Uh, uh, both, both, actually. Um, uh, the reason that I've opposed impeachment, and I, I really defer to no one in my contempt for his presidency. I think he's pretty easily now uh, the worst president that we've had. Maybe Buchanan. He and B if you study James Buchanan really closely, it's, 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 it's kind of close, but. Um, Did Buchanan torture? But I, I don't, let me uh, just, just try to explain why. Um, I don't believe that the founders created the impeachment process as something that should be used um, uh, except in the case of uh, what was described by the Constitution as high crimes and misdemeanors. So I was Torture dramatically, excuse me, just, just one minute. Uh, I, was I was strongly against the impeachment of President Clinton. And actually at the dawn of our republic, um, if you go back and you look at the administrations of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, there were impeachment efforts then which were eventually resisted because we realized that if we did that, we'd just be constantly trying to overturn an election before the election took place and we'd be more of a parliamentary system. We could make an argument that a parliamentary system is superior in certain ways, but we don't have a parliamentary system. Uh, we have a system where our accountability, and there's been a tremendous dearth of accountability. I didn't talk much tonight about President Bush because he's on the way out the door but we've had very little accountability. Our accountability mechanism should be elections, and, um, and that's where you toss them out. So impeachment uh, is when the president, as President Nixon was, was guilty of high crimes and misdemeanors. The misdemeanors is kind of, that's high crimes. Is a war a high crime? Now you say uh, prosecuted for war crimes. Um, I am not going to defend uh, the Iraq war, but I don't think we want to get into a situation where when we uh, feel that uh, the president with the backing of the Congress, should we, should we impeach all of them too, um, you know, has taken us down a terrible path. Um, the, I don't believe that the recourse uh, for that is impeachment. The recourse of that should have been defeat in 2004, and now it is uh, to turn to the, other, uh, to the other party. So I think that we would be in a, especially right now, to impeach him would just be a, a silly waste of energy and also politically stupid of the Democrats. The reason that the Democrats resisted impeachment is they wanted to win this 2008 election, and they realized that these elections, as I mentioned, are won in the center of the country. It's a center country. It is not the United States. I'm sorry to tell you, as I think you know, it's not Santa Barbara. It's not going to be Santa Barbara anytime soon. <laughs> now, I happen to think that we're becoming a center-left country, uh, and that I, I had a, a really, I thought, and I think our readers did too, an interesting exchange with the editor of Newsweek in the current issue of Newsweek. He wrote a cover story saying we're still a center-right country. 
I said we're center center right now, but we're headed center left for a lot of reasons we could talk about. But if if we and I believe that the next president's the, the, the danger for Obama is not that he moves too quickly to the left, but that he moves too slowly and doesn't show that he's working next year to dent the real problems. But that doesn't mean adhering to every part of the uh, liberal agenda and, and doing things that are politically stupid. And to have gone last year, to have spent the last year engaged in, in an impeachment effort uh, against President Bush would have weakened uh, the Democrats in, in 2000. Uh, the American people weren't for it, and we would have uh, seen Democrats out of step with the public and less likely to win the 2008 election and expand their control in the Congress. So sometimes you need to make pragmatic decisions that are at odds with justice even, or particularly at odds with spleen venting in a sense of uh, sense of grievance. And this is a very, this is going to be a very important test for, for liberals in, in a, if Obama wins. He will disappoint you. You should have seen how disappointed liberals were with Franklin Roosevelt. A lot of people in this room wouldn't have been for Franklin Roosevelt in 1932. He wasn't even for ending prohibition. He wasn't a wet, he wasn't a dry, he was a damp on prohibition. What a straddler, what a trimmer. You know, and Eleanor wouldn't speak to him for a week because he he uh, renounced, he, he drifted away from the League of Nations, which, you know, the predecessor of the UN, which is what he got into politics for in the first place. And he's drifting away, cutting corners to try. So when Obama did this thing where he didn't want to have the telephone companies, uh, you know, he wanted them immunized, he went along with that. He wasn't in favor of immunizing them, but he didn't want to make a big fight out of it. And, and a certain number of liberals went crazy. My reaction was, hey, Get a life. This is politics. It's the art of the possible, of getting things done. Nobody is going to satisfy you 100% of the time. The perfect should not be the enemy of the good. And if you th even if you think that impeachment was perfect, it, 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 it would become the enemy of the good, which is making progress uh, toward changing our country. That's a really long-winded answer to your question. And it's a good one, because a lot of people are wondering about it. Um, hi. Uh, so my question is actually about economic policy, which is, you know, talking about this sort of shift to the center left, all of my sort of political formative years, it seemed that economic policy was really fundamentally driven by this idea of balanced budgets, of running everything through the Fed, of no money for sort of social programs, uh, keeping taxes low. I was wondering if you see more the, the room of flexibility opening in the next few years, given the, the way in which the sort of $700 billion nationalization of the banking industry, even though socialism has now become a, a, a sort of talking point in the news, has sort of opened up the, the boundaries for what is possible in terms of especially things like uh, creating uh, jobs through sort of government public works. I think you're absolutely right. That's what I wrote about, actually, in the current issue of the magazine, because I don't, I think it was so fortunate for Obama that this happened on Bush's watch, um, because you had a, a Republican president giving what is going to be more than a trillion dollars to needy banks. And so next year, when a Democratic president wants to do, give much less money, to help needy people, people who don't have health insurance or don't have a job, uh, are the Republicans really going to argue it was good enough for the banks, but not good enough for people? And I don't think they're going to have a lot of success with that argument. So that's why I think we're moving, just your point is exactly right, that's why I think we're moving center left. Um, because we're, we're entering, it's very similar to the New Deal period, where the social contract between the people and their government is, is in the process of being redrawn. If we owe banks a bailout, why don't we owe Americans a bailout? And there's going to be uh, a lot of uh, pressure to that effect. And I think we're moving in economic terms into what I think of as neo-Keynesianism, where, where uh, you know, John Maynard Keynes had, you know, th this idea that when you were in an economic downturn, you, you could use deficit spending, government spending, 
uh, to get the economy moving again, uh, and, and you get some things in the bargain, uh, jobs, rebuilding your infrastructure. In the case of the New Deal, they planted three billion trees. They probably built the highway that you drove in on. They you know, basically built the country that we have. And our country is in disrepair now, and we need, we're going to need, to, as unemployment goes up, to put people to work rebuilding infrastructure. And I think the political culture, if they play their cards right, will support a return to progressivism. It might not be called liberalism because they did a number on that word you know, over the last 20 years, but it will be on economic policy, some progressive uh, uh, return to some progressive values. And, and I think that is quite possible that we will see that next year. Now they're not gonna, they might not be as big, the jobs programs might not be as big as you or I would like, but I, I think they will, uh, they will exist and we'll see, um, Obama has talked about this, uh, investing in a green economy um, and using, um, uh, investing in those new technologies, um, 150 a billion just, just in the alternative energy part of it um, is, is what his plan is. And this entire stimulus, if you add it all up, uh, is uh, going to be 175 billion just, just in the first uh, you know, few years. And that's it's not, not a trillion, but it's, it's real money. So Thanks very much. Yes. Hi there. Um, I liked your reference to the low information voter and also to make the um, um, knowledge base but the experience base as, as a topic um, of which people should take a look. My concern, and I'm hoping you'll help me better understand this, is I consider myself a pretty educated person and yet I want someone as my president who certainly is more educated and knows more than I do. That seems to be a problem with most of the American people. They don't value an education so that you get the elitist, you get the um, someone who is smart being almost, um, that's a negative. Well, we don't know yet whether you, you said that's a problem with most of the American people. We won't know for two weeks whether it's most of the American people or a problem with a minority of the American people. <laughs> uh, so that's part of what elections are, are for. But I agree with you that there, there was a troubling anti-intellectual strain to some of the commentary at the uh, Republican convention, and you know, elite became a dirty, a dirty word. word, and and it, it shouldn't be. People, uh, but I do think there were also uh, quite a large number of people who reacted the same way you did. You know, the original punditry after the Palin appointment was, oh, you know, she's so charming. She's all the women are going to vote for her, and actually, <laughs> large numbers of women had a really very strongly negative reaction to her selection. Uh, so. And that, that is not just Santa Barbara, you know? That, that's something that was really pretty common in lots of parts of the country. And so what I think the, the effect of Sarah Palin, and we are gonna have her around in our politics for a long time, was you know, she just electrified certain people in the base of the Republican Party. Um, but that, I mean, basically, um, the breakdown of American politics isn't that complicated. You've got 40% who are conservatives and, and Republican, uh, largely. And then you've got about 40% who don't call themselves liberals, all of them, but they're basically Democrats. And then you have 20, maybe I'm a little off on the margin, you've got 20 to 25%, some say 30%, who are independents, they're in the middle, and they go different directions. And so sometimes I think what we do and, and, and is that because we're just coming out of this Reagan era that started in 1980, there's this assumption which Sarah Palin wants to encourage that, you know, small town America that doesn't like intellectuals and doesn't like Rudy Giuliani calling them cosmopolitans, which was rich, uh, that, 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 that somehow, that that's, that's the majority, you know, and it, it's, it's not necessarily the majority. I mean, you know, the, the, the Joe the plumber, average Joe, silent majority, moral majority. Sometimes they're the majority and sometimes not. It depends on the election. But they've been very good semantically at kind of convincing a certain number of people that that is the real America. That's not the real America any more than Santa Barbara is the real America. Neither of them are the real America. And the real America is somewhere you know, in between 
Santa Barbara and the Upper West Side on one side of Manhattan and, and uh, you know, and, and, and Sarah Palin and, you know, uh, Idaho uh, on the other. Um, so these things are fought out in the middle and this, uh, and so I, did, I wouldn't get too concerned about that unless I was a Republican. If I was a Republican, I'd be really concerned about that. And the reason is that ultimately, if you decide, if there was a party called the Know Nothings in the 1850s, you know, if you want to become a Know Nothing party, you are going to limit your future. You're going to limit your base, uh, because most people in this country do believe in education. They do believe that 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 is. And I will say most. You know, if you look at how most Americans react to that. Now, they go back and forth on wanting their politicians to be just like them and people they want to have a beer with and, and people they look up to. They want it all. They want to be able to have a beer with you and look up to you, you know. But, um, but mostly I think that they do uh, respond on, on, on some level to, to uh, somebody who is... Uh, uh, more thoughtful and intelligent. Uh, you know, otherwise, look, wh why would a, s a freshman senator from Illinois, wh why would he have done as well as he has if people weren't on some level responding to his, his intelligence? This racism that comes out of these Palin rallies is really scary to me. Uh, I'm quite ashamed of it. And my question for you is, what do you think that says about the Republican Party and the state of this country? Well, um, I, I don't, uh, I, I think it, it, I went on Keith Olbermann on the night of one of the debates and you know, I talked about unleashing the furies of the dark side of American politics and you know, I, I share your uh, concern about it, um, but um, I, I'm not sure that it is reflective of all that many people. It doesn't take that many people to disrupt a rally or to do bad things. But it reminds me a little bit of um, in New Hampshire during the Democratic primary up there, a couple of idiots uh, stood up and held up a sign at a Hillary rally, you know, iron my shirts. And it was really sexist, offensive stuff, right? But I thought that the punditry that said, oh, you know, you know, there, there's just so much sexism and people who are against Hillary Clinton are all a bunch of sexists. And, you know, there were people who said that about folks at MSNBC, as you know. Um, I'm not sure those iron my shirts clowns, how many people they really represented. I don't know how many people uh, these, these idiots at the Palin rally represent. That's what elections are for. We're gonna find out whether it's just you know, part of a fringe, there's always a fringe in America, or whether it's something that, that actually um, counts. Now, my sense is that the effect will be that there'll be more of those folks than we thought, but m probably not enough to defeat Obama. It'll be a little bit like 1960, when uh, there was a tremendous amount of anti-Catholic feeling, and things were said at rallies that were just horrible at, uh, uh, Nixon rallies that year, running against Kennedy, just just the most awful anti-Catholic bias, and uh, Kennedy went in with you know pretty uh, a little bit less than Obama's lead, but a pretty solid lead in the polls, and he won by a hair.